Okay, so uh, today we have uh, a bit of a complicated lecture, as Elena has mentioned before. It's because we have not only a topic on key formats in Bitcoin, but also some kind of a preliminary topic uh, with introduction to elliptic curve cryptography. It is complex, and uh, I totally understand that you may not... Uh, fully grasp everything from the first time and it, it is completely okay so uh first of all as always if you do have any questions then uh of course write them down or ask me after we are done with the lecture and uh, the second it's uh we always have the materials uh in the in google classroom and if you have uh, any more questions even after the lecture you can talk to us in Google Classroom, and we will try to help you understand. But of course, I will try to make it as as understandable and as easy as possible. But of course, the topic is quite complex, so uh, it is okay if you don't grasp it uh, from the get go. So let's start. Um, and let's start with the definition of a group, because this is one of the fundamental definitions that we will need in order to proceed. So um, there is such a branch in mathematics, which in mathematics, which is called abstract algebra or modern algebra. Uh, among other things that uh, abstract algebra studies, it uh, includes groups, rings, and fields. They are kind of similar, and we will not uh, talk too much about the differences between them and so on and so on, because we are here uh, quite limited on time, and we are not um, really to teach you about algebra, but about decentralized technologies. So, but uh, what is a group anyways? What is a group? Imagine a non-empty set, and uh, again, set, it is um, the mathematical, in the mathematical sense, uh, with certain elements. These elements can be numbers, uh, vectors, or even matrices, or even something as complex as data structures. So uh, we can have a set of, uh, uh, sorry, a group of uh, even certain data structures. The main difference between a group and a regular set is that a group has certain group operation. It has one, this specific group operation, and this operation is binary, which means that it always takes uh, one operation can take only two arguments. So argument A and argument B, uh, the operation is performed for these two elements. And the result, very important feature, is the result of um, executing this operation is, a num again, a number, a, a vector, a matrix, which is also in the group. So, um, if we add A and B and uh, get C as the result, C will be also belong to group. And uh, yeah, we will talk about the rest of the features uh, uh, in a few minutes. Here you see that we have addition, we have plus sign, but it is not, of course, an arithmetic addition. Uh, we just call this operation addition for convenience. Uh, Yet, it is important to understand that uh, for more complex uh, elements of the group, such as matri matrices, for example, it is it will be impossible to perform the regular addition. So there will not be such a case for complex uh, groups as 2 plus 3 equals 5 uh, for each uh, matrix that uh, we will perform this addition two, we will have a certain appropriate operation for these matrices. Now, as for the features, feature number one is if A belongs to group and B belongs to group, then the result of their addition of their uh, group operation will also below uh, belong to G. This is the main feature of the group as the algebraic concept. 
uh, the second feature is called associativity. Uh, so if we add A plus B first and then we add C, it will be the same as if we added B plus C and then added A. The third feature, there exists an element zero with um, the following notation. So if you add uh, A, to zero, it's the same as adding zero to A, and it's the same as simply having A, because this zero element uh, does not influence the element that we are adding it to. And this is called a neutral element. So here, zero in, in this example is the neutral element, because it does not change the, um, the value. The next feature is each element A has an inverse element B for which the following condition is fulfilled. So if we uh, perform addition of A plus B, it will be zero because B is an inverse element of A. And the fifth feature is, uh, and yeah, fourth feature is additional. It is not always uh, a requirement and it depends on the group. So it is additional uh, feature. The fifth feature is called commutativity, and uh, the group which satisfies this uh, feature is called a Belian group. It means that A plus B equals B plus A. So not always it will be the case. Uh, and in simple words, commutativity means that the order of addition of uh, elements does not matter. And of course, not all groups are a Belian groups, uh, but all abelian groups um, are well groups with the rest of the of the features uh, and sometimes without this one so next uh, next is uh, well group for elliptic curves how does this whole uh, concept of bitcoin and elliptic curves and groups connect and now we will find out so uh, for elliptic curves, the group element, the one element of the group, is simply a point on the curve. Uh, usually points are represented with uh, Descartes uh, coordinates uh, in, in Descartes coordinate system and have two coordinates, X and Y. So just on a regular uh, Descartes coordinates uh, system, we have a point with X and Y coordinates, but it is not always the case and sometimes um, uh, points are presented, presented in the form of affine points, but it is uh, uh, not our case and we will not stop too uh, much on this. The next is zero element. This neutral element is the point at infinity. This point, which is infinitely far, it um, approaches positive infinity and the inverse, it uh, uh, approaches negative infinity. The reverse point, uh, the reverse element of a specific point is symmetrical uh, for the x-axis. So uh, it will be more clear on the graph, but you can imagine that the top of the curve is um, inverted uh, relatively to the bottom of the curve. So we can fold it like a piece of paper and they will match perfectly. And the fourth feature is the sum of three non-zero points lying on the same line will be equal to zero. And again, we will look more graphically and uh, it will be more clear. Uh, this is the curve equation um, and uh, it is an overall uh, equation for the elliptic curve. So we have y uh, squared equals x to the third power plus a uh, by x and plus b. a and b are constants which are specified. Uh, these con constants are different for each elliptic curve. So, for example, in uh, Bitcoin, a equals zero and b equals seven. So, the way this curve looks for Bitcoin is y to the power of two equals x to the power of three plus seven. So this simply cancels out because a is equal to zero. And also one thing to note is that both of these um, of this, um, constants are integers, so they can be above zero, below zero, and they can also be equal zero as we see 
from the example of Bitcoin. Next, uh, features of how elliptic curves work. So this is the graphical representation of elliptic curve in Bitcoin, and this is a section of the curve. So a zoomed out, we have zoomed out um, this part over here. So some of you may notice that uh, this part and this part of the curve aren't really a curve, so to say, or at least it doesn't really look like a curve. Of course, this is here it's clear, right? But here it uh, kind of looks like a straight line. But this section um, are, in fact, if we look at the actual graph and if we magnify it enough, it will be clear that this is a curve. It has uh, an angle, it has some curvature, and it goes to positive infinity and to negative infinity. And this is just the um, degree of magnification that doesn't really allow to see it clearly. And as for the section of the curve, um, uh, in reality, the uh, points that we are using in the real real life calculations do not uh, <clears throat> um, th they are very big numbers so um, they are located not close to the center of the coordinate system not here not here not here but these numbers are very very big so they are far away um, towards the infinity so way out of the scope of this and even this they go way 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 beyond of these uh, numbers because uh, well we will explain why but in a nutshell because it makes it more uh, secure from uh, logarithmic attacks and but for for uh, more simplicity and for a uh, more um, illustrative purpose we will choose points that are close to here so um, it is it looks more clear uh, how does the line how are lines drawn how the um, uh, points correspond where does the third point appear and so on so just so you um, understand that we are only showing it for illustrative purposes. Now let's um, look at two very important processes, the uh, sum of two points and the doubling of two points. Uh, the first method that we are going to look at is the um, uh, graphical, the um, not algebraic, but rather geometric. Uh, geometric approach to solving this problem. So let's first look at the uh, sum, uh, at the addition of two points. So we have point A1 on the curve and we have point A2 on the curve. As we remember from, uh, from the features of elliptic curves, adding this curve, uh, um, drawing a line through these two points will produce a third point which is located on the curve, which means that this third point also belongs to the group. This curve is our group, in fact. So once we have drawn a line, um, we get a third point. And unless, of course, this line is drawn perpendicularly, there will be a third point. And the result of this geometric addition will be the point which is um, mirrored. So the result actually will be not a three, um, but minus a three, because we uh, take as the result the symmetrical point to this third point over here. So uh, we take point one, take point two, draw the line, get point three, and then take the inverted, the symmetrical point on the, um, well, on, uh, which also belongs to the same uh, group. Now, as for doubling the points, uh, obviously, uh, when you are adding the point to itself, there is no second point anywhere on the uh, on the curve right so we have only one point over here and there's nothing we really we can do to uh well uh to to add another 
point because it would be addition, not doubling uh, operation. And in order to draw a line through A1, which we want to double, we um, uh, draw a tangent line. Uh, this line here is called a tangent line because it only barely touches the curve and it goes through the point that we are doubling. Uh, once we draw this uh, tangent line, we get point A3, which here it's minus A3 because it's um, below the x-axis. And we look at the symmetrical point to minus A3 and get A3. So here uh, A3 is the result of doubling uh, of point A1. Now let's um, talk about algebraic addition. In fact, uh, it may look a little bit complex uh, on the first glance because we have all these um, complex equations and all these uh, letters and powers and so on. But in reality, it's really simple. So let's say we have two points. One point is P and other point is Q. And each of the points has its own coordinates, X and Y. We want to get R, which is the result of algebraic addition. So here we will have X coordinate of R, and here we will have Y coordinate of R. In order to do that, we first need to calculate a parameter M, which is the angle of inclination, either of the line, which uh, goes through this two points or the tangent line if we are doing the doubling operation. And this angle of inclination is simply calculated as follows. So we take y coordinate of P, uh, y coordinate of Q, we uh, subtract this, uh, sorry, uh, this from this, and then we do the same for x coordinate. So we subtract x coordinate uh, of q from x coordinate of p and then we uh, divide the results and get our um, angle of inclination then for xr we have uh, the following equations so uh, x uh, um, coordinate is obtained as uh, m squared minus x of point P minus X of point Q. And as for R, we do it uh, similarly, but we take Y of point P, add the, um, this angle of inclination multiplied by X of R. So you see here, uh, in order to calculate Y of the resulting point, we need to first know the X of the resulting point because it is used in the uh, equation. And then we uh, subtract from it uh, the X coordinate of B. Uh, and these calculations are simple and straightforward, even for the computer. Uh, maybe only the uh, power to two uh, is more complex to calculate, but nevertheless, all of them are e easily um, calculated even on paper, uh, but for computer it is also quite simple. But you have to remember that in practice, the initial coordinates, this uh, uh, x of p, y of p, uh, and x of q, y of q, are very, very, very big numbers. And uh, it will not, uh, sometimes it will be simply impossible to calculate this on paper just because of how big the numbers will be. But for computers, it is still relatively easy operation which can be performed in mere milliseconds even if you are using a mobile device for example these operations are a breeze for modern cpus now as for algebraic doubling the process goes more or less the same but the equations are different so to get uh, x coordinate of the uh, dub doubled point we again take this uh, angle of inclination, but here angle of inclination is marked as lambda, and uh, it is the inclination of the tangent uh, of the tangent line that we draw through our point. So it equals lam lambda to the power of two uh, minus two by x of the point. X one is our x um, x coordinate of our point, and 
what hides behind this lambda is actually this function, uh, this, this uh, part of the equation over here. So um, three by x one squared plus a, and again, a is uh, our constant here uh, by two of y uh, coordinate and minus two by x one. As for the y coordinate, again, uh, we have the lambda, multiplied by x of the original point but here we also subtract the value that we have calculated on the previous step and then it goes the same we open up this lambda do the calculations and obtain the result so pretty straightforward and pretty um, self-explanatory once you go through it step by step. Another important and interesting operation which is used in elliptic curve cryptography is called scalar multiplication. So uh, as you have already understood, we can perform operations on several elements of the groups. And one of such operations is adding the point to itself many times. So uh, here, for example, uh, we add point P, to itself, to itself, to itself, and times. And for the sake of the notation brewity, we denote this process by simply multiplying a point by a certain number, let's say n. So here the no 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 notation n by p means that we add p to itself n times, nothing more, nothing less. Uh, and this, this uh, whole thing presents the sc scalar multiplication. Of course, uh, you need to understand the limitations. So uh, it's impossible to add point to itself zero times. It's impossible to add point to itself minus one times or minus five times, but add it to itself, I don't know, 25 times is not a problem. Uh, and it is what this scalar multiplication does. In reality, this number n can be an extremely big number and computers can perform such a calculation quite fast, even without any optimizations. But in order to make it even faster, this process can be optimized by not simply doing the addition over and over, but um, so to say, folding this process into a series of doubling operations. So instead of uh, having this uh, algebraic addition for the point with itself, we just do the doubling and uh, the remaining uh, part of operations is done via um, addition. So um, here, for example, we can substitute P plus P with a uh, doubling of P and then just uh, do the addition of p so we have one doubling and one addition which is faster and more um more convenient for computers to calculate because well it's it's easier for them okay next we have the question of discrete logarithm in the group of elliptic curve points so here uh, we have the notation of uh, q equals scalar multiplication of p. So q is the resulting point of performing this group operation. And p is the point which was simply added to itself n times in order to obtain a certain point q. The search for a discrete logarithm solves the problem of finding such n. So uh, it is the task which aims at finding n by knowing only q. Uh, it is a well-known math problem. And uh, the reason why it is a problem is because for a very big n, this poses a real calculational issue because computers will take a lot of like a really a lot of time to calculate it um, when n is really a big number. And since it is not a regular arithmetics, we cannot simply divide q by p uh, and receive n. So the, the, such rules don't apply here. And what we really have to do is to um, 
brute force our way through the problem uh, by doing this for an practically infinite am uh, amount of time considering how large the m can actually be and you will have to brute force through every single value uh, and check whether it produces the right result or not so uh, of course there are certain algorithms that are more effective or less effective for solving this problem but still it is um brute force one way or another it's not like there's some genius um, algorithm which would solve this discrete logarithm problem and this is why it is called a problem and the whole security of um, elliptic curve algorithms is based on this very feature since uh, unless you know the secret value and you cannot uh, for example generate a digital signature on someone's behalf and you cannot know this number unless it was compromised or you are the one who keeps this uh, secret on your premises now um we are almost done with the elliptic cryptography for today so bear with me for literally two more slides and we will be done with this and we will move to uh, keys in bitcoin so another important thing uh, term that you need to know is group order and group order is the number of points in a group simply the number of points in a group so how many points in the group is represented by the group order also there's a term which is called the base point and by using this point the coordinates of which are known to everyone uh, you can perform a scalar multiplication uh, with this point and receive almost all elements of the group not all but almost uh, all of them so by doing this operation for the base point, you receive a subgroup of points uh, that are contained in this main group. And the base point of the group also has its own order, order of the uh, subgroup, which denotes how many elements are in this subgroup. And this is also used for um, operations and for cryptography uh, involving elliptic curves now more like to applicable level so um, to tie everything together uh, and to uh, prepare into tra translating this knowledge for um, bitcoin's uh, elliptic curve cryptography so uh, if we are performing cryptographic operations on elliptic curves the private key sk will be a large natural number from one to the value of the order of the subgroup of the base point order minus one so from one to the base to the number of elements in the base point subgroup but one less so we don't uh, get out of bounds uh, and the public key pk in this case is the result of the scalar multiplication it's scalar product it, it also uh, can be said the scalar product of the base point on sk so we generate a secret uh, private key sk just random large natural number from uh, base point subgroup and then we multiply the base point do the scalar product uh, multiply sk mm -hmm by the base point and we receive the public key and since um the feature that we have discussed here the discrete logarithm problem by knowing the public key uh you will not be able to derive so even if you know the public key and you know the uh base point because base point is known to everyone you will not be able to derive the private key or at least you will not be able to do so in any uh meaningful number uh, in any meaningful amount of time uh, but of course there is a chance if someone uh, tries to do so although this ch chance is very small now finally key data in bitcoin everything will come together now hopefully just a brief reminder to catch a breath uh, 
And this reminder is about the sizes of uh, keys and addresses in Bitcoin. So private key is a random number with 256 bit size. So you see how large is this number. It's 256 bit in size. The public key is the point on the curve, which uh, has the size of 512 bits. And address is the hash value of the public key, 160 bit, because RIPE MD 160. And I believe you do remember that from previous lectures because we have uh, dedicated quite some time um, to the process of this whole generation and uh, how to obtain private uh, address ha having the uh, private key. Now, there are several uh, formats for private key. One is hexadecimal, when we simply represent the key in hexadecimal format. The second is compressed hexadecimal, which means that uh, the public key is derived in compressed format. The next is wallet import format, and this is uh, a special format which is used, uh, as you may have guessed it, in wallets. It is more convenient and has the checksum, which allows to find out whether the private key was corrupted somewhere uh, during the transmission of it over the over over the the uh, environment from the sender to the recipient the next is a wallet import format but compressed it's the same as hex compressed but for wallet import format and the last one is wallet import format encrypted according to the beep 38 proposal so now let's look at each of them in more detail so hexadecimal is as simple as it gets. You have a number in hexadecimal and this is it. So since the private key is simply a very big number, we can write it in any um, in any um, in any uh, numerical system we want. We can write it in binary, we can write it in decimal, we can write it in octodecimal, hexadecimal and so on. Here uh hexadecimal was chosen and it has numbers from uh, 0 through 9 and letters a b c d e f so you see it here they all are present here and it is used to obtain a simple uncompressed public key so if we if you see a private key like that it means that you will be deriving a simple uncompressed public key and important feature and uh, disadvantage of transferring keys in the hex format is that there is no way to find out a mistake in the hex encoded key. So if you made a mistake somewhere here, so for example, you wrote not zero, but uh, one here, I don't know, for example, one here, the wallet will still import this incorrect private key and you will get practically non-existent address. So uh, it will not have your coins, it will not have your transactions, it will not have anything. It will be probably very likely just an empty uh, address which has zero uh, coins associated with it and maybe even zero transactions. Hex compressed is uh, still hexadecimal format and it is used as uh, a way to generate compressed public keys. In fact, the private key remains of the same length and it even becomes one byte larger because we have this byte uh, here. And this prefix byte is used to distinguish the uncompressed private key from hex compressed private key. And we will look at the compression part a little bit later, but so far what you need to know is that hex compressed format has this 0, 1 prefix at the beginning. Now as for the wallet import format, it is used for uh, easy transfer of the private key because you see it um, uses different encoding. So here we have base 58 check, uh, which is used for encoding instead of hexadecimal. It has a different version byte. Uh, so when we are passing this wallet import format private key, it will have a different version byte so that uh, other participants of the network can understand what to do with that. And it has prefix 
five, which denotes that whatever comes after the five is the wallet import format. Important feature of this format is that it allows finding the error because it includes the checksum, it allows uh, finding the error and, uh, well, uh, fixing the error or requesting the uh, the private key once again to import your uh, your private key, not corrupted or not someone else's. Wallet import format can also be compressed and it is used for convenient transfer of, uh, uh, of, the, of compressed private key from which we derive the compressed public key. So you see the, uh, again, a private key is not really compressed per se. It's, it's just uh, denotes that it will uh, carry a compressed public key. Again, it uses base 58 check for encoding. It has also, as you see here, the same version byte, and it has a prefix K or L, uh, which is the result of this uh, encoding. And it also is used to uh, denote that it is um, compressed wallet import format key. Private key can also be encrypted, and this is used uh, to uh, store it, for example, um, somewhere to back it up, to pass it over the unprotected channel of communication, and for other cases when you are concerned about the about your private key not being disclosed in an open form to anyone. It still uses base58 check for encoding. It has a different version byte and it has prefix 6p, which denotes that this is encrypted private key. And of course, uh, you do have the encryption key for your private key, which you need to uh, store appropriately. Maybe you can encode the key as well or whatever, or you just memorize it if you have a very good memory, but, uh, you still need to take care of the decryption key anyway. Here is the example of an encrypted private key. So here is the original one. It is wallet import format uh, private key. This is the passphrase. This can be a passphrase, a password, whatever. So this is a string from which you derive the encryption key. And once you encrypt the private key, you get the encrypted key with this prefix at the start and a complete, completely different value since, well, it is encrypted. Now let's look at the example of the public key. A public key in Bitcoin is as simple as it gets. It is just two coordinates of the point concatenated together. So you see here we have, let's say that our public key is K. It has coordinates X and Y. This is the X coordinate. This is the Y coordinate. And we simply smoosh them together and we get this, uh, this key over here. So uh, this is like this line break doesn't mean that they are separated. They are on one line. There is no uh, delimiter, no line break, no comma, nothing. They are simply concatenated together. And this is how our key would, uh, sorry, our uh, point would, our public key point would have looked on the uh, curve itself. So we have X is two and Y is four. And this would be the public key, the resulting public key, which we have received by the by uh, first generating the private key and then performing the scalar multiplication operation. Now, as for the public key compression. So um, here again, we have a public key in the form of a point on a curve. We have X and we have Y. Uncompressed public key will have the prefix zero four and uh, these two points concatenated together. But for uh, the compressed public key, we have, uh, basically we need to uh, keep only one, only one um, coordinate and this coordinate is X. So we can basically um, 
delete this y coordinate and we don't really have to carry this coordinate because they are symmetric anyway so uh, we only need to know uh, x and in order to understand for 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 um whoever sees this key uh, to understand so where is y how do i get the y coordinate we have a different prefix so uh, if y is more than zero this prefix will be zero two and then we have the x key and nothing else uh, but if y is less than zero we have uh, zero three prefix and then again x coordinate and nothing else it, it is uh, as it is so let's say we have this public key here. We have only x coordinate, and by looking at this um, at this uh, prefix over here, we know that uh, y is above zero. So it is above zero. It's more than zero. So we need to look to the top. We need to look above, uh, relatively to the x coordinate, and here. Um, I think it's better to illustrate, uh, or actually, no, that's that's right. So we have the point P here, uh, and we have the X coordinate. So let's say we don't have this point yet. We have only X coordinate, which is two, and we have the prefix O2, which stands Y is more than zero. So by having this uh, knowledge, we simply go to the top, uh, until we meet the curve. So until we encounter the curve, we just go up, 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 up. And the moment we encounter the curve, we know that this is where the Y coordinate of this point is. And then we had X at the beginning, we had uh, this marker at the beginning of the key, and we have just obtained the Y coordinate. And if we remember that, uh, both x and y coordinates are extremely large numbers, then you are saving up a lot of space. So just look here, you are saving twice as much space. And instead of passing um, this whole string for the public key, you are passing only an x coordinate and only a small prefix at the beginning, which uh, cannot even be compared to the whole, uh, to pass in the whole um coordinate of y and if we had a uh, prefix here zero three it would mean that we need to go to the bottom so we are going below the x axis and we go down 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 until we meet the curve which is somewhere right here so we will get the y coordinate which is somewhere around minus four which is not really at minus four but well somewhere close to minus four and this is how the public key compression works in bitcoin since in reality public keys are rarely used in bitcoin for sending uh, payments or passing over to receive coins etc and instead addresses are used uh, public keys have basically only two formats first is hex uh, and the second is hex compressed and simply for hexadecimal format it's um, prefix 04 and this whole big string that we have uh, that we obtain by concatenating the coordinates and then compressed as we have already uh, learned is that we have 02 we have 03 so again 02 if y is larger than zero and 03 if y is smaller than zero and we have only the x coordinate and the y coordinate is derived based on this prefix and this is it for the uh, main content of the lecture, but I felt that um, it would be great to uh, spark maybe some, uh, a little bit of fun and uh, show you this a little practical example that you can do, uh, but well, okay. Uh, on one of the previous lectures, I remember we had a question uh, which went something like that. What if I simply um, choose a random private key, go through all this process and generate the uh, 
well, private key, derive everything and basically get access to someone else's coins. So uh, can I steal someone else's coins by uh, taking a shot in the dark and uh, just randomly uh, choosing a private uh, key, which would hopefully unlock me some access to someone else's coins. And uh, then I have said that it is practically impossible because of the uh size of the mere size of these numbers and i hope that uh after today's lecture you have a little bit of better understanding why exactly is this happening and why uh, large numbers are important but i also remember advising to use um a pro a piece of software a utility i don't know how to call it which is called plutus and what plutus does is basically uh, takes a shot in the dark by generating a random number and then going through all of the steps to eventually generate the address. Interesting thing is that uh, generated address in the is then checked against a database. Uh, and this database is simply a text file which contains addresses with no zero balance. And this uh, text file is stored together with the program. Uh, and of course, to obtain this, uh, this list of um, addresses with non-zero amount of coins, you simply need to parse it from uh, some blockchain explorer. So once, once you have the list, you start brute force. You generate the random number, then you generate uh, and this gen this uh, random number is your private key. Then you generate the public key. Then you generate address and check it to the correspondence with the one that has coins. If your private key that you have generated randomly has uh, corresponded to an address which has coins in the net on the network, then congratulations, you have stolen someone else's money. But I decided to go further and to make an experiment just for you. I have rented a cloud machine with one full CPU, not virtual CPU, one full uh, proper CPU, four gigabytes of RAM, just in case. And I have um, uh, started Plutus uh, this morning, uh, somewhere around like 9 a.m. And it was working up to this very moment. And when I checked it right before the lecture, there was nothing. So it has worked for the full day and it has found nothing. So you can imagine it was working for like 10 hours already and zero results. So all of these addresses that you are seeing here are valid, really valid addresses. And they are generated, they are properly generated by going through all of the steps of the process, but they have zero coins so you haven't achieved anything and you have haven't stolen anyone else's money and uh, this just proves uh, how unlikely it is that simply by um, trying out um, random numbers and trying out random private keys you will be able to steal someone else's coins if I'm not mistaken right now, the total number of addresses uh, that can be in Bitcoin is 2 to the power of 160. And uh, considering that on average, one address is generated every 0 .0, 0 0.002 seconds, uh, you can calculate that it will take... Um, billions literally i did some calculations it will take billions of years to uh do this uh, brute forcing for every single address in bitcoin and of course there are a few caveats here the first is that uh, the more threads you have the faster you will be able to brute force for example my machine my cloud machine was able to uh bluetooth was able to capture two threads so um uh, it was actually not 0 0.002 seconds, but 0 0.001 seconds per one address. But still, it was taking a lot of time. The second uh, caveat is that, uh, of course, CPUs are 
not the most efficient for such specific operations and this uh, software is not tailored for making GPU optimized computations it just uses uh, CPU and the third caveat is that um, you still rely on the database so you need to always have the relevant database and the one I have been using is from I believe November of the previous year I wasn't feeling like parsing a new database so I just used the one they have provided so it is likely that even if one of them had coins they would have been already spent by this moment but if you really want to prove a point and to um, steal someone else's bitcoins by brute forcing uh, random private keys I invite you to do so but consider the things I have said uh, so the first is do it optimized for GPU second is um, uh, do solve the problem with the um, with the database and well the third is uh, uh, well at least solve these two problems and it would already be uh, pretty nice to see the result and maybe you could even become a millionaire by doing so but this is the end for today and uh, now is a good time for questions so if you have any let's discuss them right now and actually i have just checked the results again and i have zero uh success so uh i think that this experiment can be concluded at least for the sake of today's lecture so uh yep i see a question from uh dan dan please go ahead uh, it's a little bit on other team. Uh, how public address and uh, oh, public key and address is different? Uh, for some reason, I always thought that um, Bitcoin address is public key. Uh, yeah, thank you for the question. And uh, they are not the same, but the address is generated from the public key by um, hashing it with two algorithms uh, sha 256 and then uh, sha or oh, sorry ripe md160 and uh, also encoding it in the process so you get the address it's uh, uh, it, it's derived from the public key but it is not equal to the public key and um, uh, among other reasons it is done to protect uh, the actual public key from being disclosed because it, in theory, it can pose some vulnerability and allow the attacker to um, reverse and somehow get the private key. So, okay, thank you. Uh, yep, thank you for the question. Any more questions? Okay, uh, then I think we are done for today. Thank, Thank you, you guys. Much, Alex. Thank you very much. It's uh, not a simple topic, but uh, it's a very good uh, job. Okay, uh, see you soon. And uh, at the next uh, uh, le lecture, we will talk about Ethereum and uh, smart contracts and uh, this part of our course see you soon goodbye yep thank you everyone bye 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 bye